even years later? <laughs> the, the studies have limitations. But you can imagine, because there's not any structural changes, that any pain reduction would be due to neurophysiological or neurochemical reasons, as opposed to structural, where you might see that with manipulation or soft tissue work or something like that, or surgery. Okay, so what are some reasons why the public believes that people have lower back pain? What are the, the most common uh, reasons that people believe that people have lower back pain? Okay. What do you hear people say all the time? Yeah, my, my disc slipped. Doc says he's back yet me. Okay. What do physical therapists generally say the reason why people's backs hurt is? Your core is weak. Primarily our core is weak, right? Okay, that ambiguous, you know, catch-all. Okay, why do chiropractors say that back pain occurs, generally speaking? Nerves are not in alignment. Right, so their vertebrae are out of position or whatever. Okay. Uh, why do acupuncturists believe that lower back pain exists generally? Right? So our chi is off. Gallbladder's not functioning properly. Okay. Orthopedic surgeons, what's their go-to? They're primarily looking for disc pathology, right? Okay. So everybody has that lens that they're looking for as the causative effect of back pain. Now, we know that back pain is ubiquitous. It exists across the spectrum. Over 80% of people, particularly in the United States, will develop lower back pain in their lifetime. It is one of the main detractors from people being able to work, um, and it exists across the spectrum, whether it's from physical labor jobs or people sitting at a desk all day. So there's a lot of evolutionary biologists that claim that a lot of our back pain is a byproduct of us becoming bipedal. Um, and you can kind of see that in the structural alignment of the back, the L5 disc and L5 vertebral body being the biggest and strongest, being able to carry the weight of the body. That being said, it's not the most optimal structure as far as being able to distribute force very well. It's very functional, allowing us to stand up above the grass and be able to see far and have our hands free so we can carry tools, but it does put the spine at a lot of risk and a lot of risk of damage. Um, so going back to the PT's perspective, there is a lot to be said about imbalances in core muscles, especially in a day where we don't do a lot of actual physical labor. And I would argue that there's a difference between a, a pathological weak core and a physiological weak core. And in fact, most people don't actually have a weak core. They have major imbalances between muscles in their core. So they could have a, an imbalance from lateral flexors from right to left. So those would be your obliques, your quadratus lumborum, um, your TA to some extent, from anterior to posterior compartment, from your rectus abdominis. Um, your psoas major, your rector spinae, your iliolongissimus, your multipedi. So what happens oftentimes is we're actually out of balance. Now back pain can also come from a, a myriad of other structures. If you have hip dysfunction, you're almost always going to have lower back pain as well. If you have sacroiliac dysfunction, you're almost always going to have lower back problems as well. If you have latissimus dorsi dysfunction, you're almost always going to have lower back pain as well. If you have a leg length differential, anatomical or physiological, you are more likely to have lower back pain. If you are heavy, if you weigh too much, you're more likely to have lower back pain. If you have had babies, you're more likely to have lower back pain. If you're elderly, you're more likely to have lower back pain. So we have a lot of uh, demographic issues that we're looking at, things that basically overlap onto each other. And then we start to add two or three of these factors on top of each other. And it's really not a surprise that people have lower back pain. So we talked previously about imbibition, right? So when is the generally scientifically accepted time frame for when discs stop refilling with fluid? Roughly 27, 25 to 30 is generally what most scientists agree is the ambition stage. So that is why in your late 30s and early 40s, we are more likely to quote unquote slip a disc. Now, we also know that as we get into a, a, a more middle aged period, our lives become a lot more predictable. So the things that you do on a daily basis tend to become very routine. We start doing the same thing over and over again. So it's not really much of a surprise that we start to develop overactive muscles in one area or underactive muscles in another area. Now, if you talk to NASM folks and people like that, or, or even Janda, we're looking at the upper cross, lower cross, most of the time we'll say that we have overactive hamstrings, overactive calves, overactive hip flexors, and I would include spinal flexors even though most people don't, and we're going to be weak in the erector spinae, so our spinal extensors and our hip extensors as well. Glute max, glute med, glute min to a certain extent. And then if we don't have the ability to inhibit the piriformis with our glute max, then we end up with things like piriformis syndrome or you know, other issues that can cause sciatica type symptoms. Also, hamstring tension can certainly lead to lower back pain. 
So we find that in the office oftentimes too, people always assume that the, the pain that they're feeling, if they feel it in their leg, is coming from their spine. When in fact, we know that oftentimes it's actually the opposite. The tension in the hamstring is pulling on the ischium, which is causing sacroiliac dysfunction. So one of the simplistic ways that you can rule that in or out is you just treat the hamstring really quickly. You can even have them do self-myofascial release. You don't actually have to treat it. But if that makes it a lot better, odds are that it's not coming from the other direction. And in fact, some of the orthopedic tests we're looking at that look for sciatic nerve or L5 um, nerve root dysfunction, so say Bacteroos, for example, or a straight leg raise, that would cause pain to shoot into the lower back could also certainly be caused by uh, posterior elements of the leg that would pull into the lower back. So if I tried to pull your leg up with a straight leg raise and you felt pain in your lower back, that's a classical orthopedic test for a disc herniation or a radiculopathy. However, if my hamstring is really tight, it can yank on the pelvis, and if my sacroiliac joint is already irritated, or my lumbosacral joint is already irritated, it's not really much of a surprise that you're going to have back pain there. Make sense? So to test our theory, we would do inhibition of the hamstring and go back and check it again. If it was significantly better, then we can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that it wasn't the nerve that's causing the issue in this particular case, and maybe they're overlapping, right? They could be. But the hamstring is actually pulling on the pelvis, causing back pain. Same thing with Bacteroos, if you guys are familiar with that. Have you guys gone over that in your in Dr. Shar's class? So basically, you're going to be sitting on the end of a table. You extend your legs all the way. And so the increased uh, intradiscal pressure is allegedly going to push the, the disc material onto the nerve, which causes sciatica-type symptoms. However, also, if you have really, really tight hamstrings, that's going to cause lower back pain. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So a lot of our classic orthopedic tests kind of have some overlap from functional tests. And that's why you guys, when you see my exams, you see a lot of overlap between the two. Like it kind of looks like a traditional orthopedic test, but we modify it to where it's more of a functional test. And, and again, you know, we talk about this a lot. Like, so one of the big issues when we're talking about healthcare providers is that they don't have a background in philosophy. So they lack the critical thinking necessary to evaluate a, you know, evaluate a problem or a scenario. You know, they, they, they lack the ability to understand logical fallacy, a priori, tu quo qui, ad hominem. Um, slippery slope types of logical fallacies because most of them have been in science their entire career and everything is dogmatic in science. It's the, it's the structure, it's the hierarchy in the scientific community. Um, you know, you, you don't challenge your elders, you don't challenge the guy from the, with a PhD from Harvard, um, which of course we know is an appeal to authority fallacy. Right off the bat, everybody is wrong at some point. I'm wrong, you're wrong, everybody's wrong to some point. But if you have the inability to recognize why you might be wrong or why you might be right, you don't really have the critical thinking ability to be a clinician. Because not everybody is the same. And you need skills in your tool set to be able to evaluate and differentiate between things that might look the same. So let's just talk about the multitude of things that could be lower back pain diagnoses, right? So muscle spasm, so Active Life actually had a post on this the other day. It was pretty good. They said a muscle spasm is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom. So what could be causing muscle spasm? Well, there's a myriad of things we've talked about in the past. We could have spinal stenosis. We could have foraminal stenosis. We could have facet syndrome. We could have facet arthrosis. We could have a disc bulge, a disc herniation. We could have vertebral body fractures. We could have imbalances in the muscles. We could have strained ligaments. We have ligaments that attach from our spinal units, right? We could have a supraspinous ligament strain. We could have a facet joint uh, approximation. Your lumbosacral joint could be stuck. Your sacroiliac joint could be causing problems. If your entire pelvis is offline, your sacrum itself could be causing some of these issues. We could have psoas problems. We could have uh, referral to the lower back from the gallbladder. We could have it from the intestines, colon cancer. One of the big symptoms is severe lower back pain. There's a lot of things that can cause back pain. So we would have muscle spasms from all of these. You can have a muscle spasm from irritation in the pelvis from imbalances in your legs. So like we'll see this in golfers all the time. They swing routinely one direction over and over again. So not only are they physiologically aligned improperly, but their muscles are imbalanced as well because the obliques are stronger. That entire sling is stronger on one side compared to the other. They generate more force this way than they do going back this way because they do a repetitive motion all the time. We see this with baseball players, pitchers, anybody, bowlers, um, they're going to have a major imbalance because they use one side of the muscle significantly more than the other side. As a result, their spinal structure actually sits in, an, in a crooked position. So they are actually structurally out of line, but not necessarily because they're out of alignment, right? Because the muscles are holding them in a crooked position. 
Now, when you're doing that, now your body can't load in an axial plane the way that it's designed to. So you're putting physically more pressure on one side of your spine than the other. That can start to wear out the posterior element. So we start to have facet de derangement on one side versus the other side. We also see what we call fatty infiltration, right? So our multifidi or muscles we don't use very well. Now the muscle itself actually starts to turn into fat. You know, we talk about the marbled look of beef and things like that. So, um, you know, what's the reason why veal is kept in a, you know, they're not allowed to move around or work out at all. It keeps the meat soft and fatty. So you don't get hypertrophy or hypertrophy of those muscles. So it doesn't have that, that thickened um, response. And, and what law is that? Davis's Davis law. Okay. So any of these things can contribute and lead to lower back pain. Now, the question is, when they come into the office, do we have the ability to discern one thing from the other, and do we have the ability to discern what we can and can't treat? So that's based on a myriad of things, right? Demographics. So if I have, like, a six-year-old with severe lower back pain, that's going to set off my alarm. I go, uh, something's probably wrong. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, a six-year-old shouldn't have a lot of lower back pain. If they do, we could be looking at a, a, you know, a bone cancer. We could be looking at leukemia. We could be looking at you know, something fairly severe. Now, if I have a 16-year-old, you know, cross-country runner or, like, a 400-meter uh, runner, like, what do, what do track runners do? They run around this, the track in one direction all the time. So that inside leg or left leg will often be jammed, so they'll have left SI joint dysfunction issues. They'll have a more developed right glute max because they're abducting as they turn around the corner and a more developed left hamstring because they're reaching out further with that leg. So as they're on the curve, they're pushing with the right and pulling with the left. They're also jamming the left. So it's a fairly predictable... Um, presentation. So one of the ways to kind of balance that would be to run the other way, but we don't do that in North America at least. Like we've seen a lot of Japanese runners that come over and they'll actually run the other way, but then they run into people, so it creates like another set of issues. So like, hey, they're, they're a better balance, but we have, you know, concussions and split skulls from people running into each other. But when we start to look at these things, we say, okay, this, this teenager has sacral leg dis joint dysfunction. They don't really, they haven't developed the muscles for long enough to really have long-standing muscle imbalances. So this is probably stuck SI joint, so in this case, manipulation would probably be fairly helpful. Now, when I'm 35 or 40, and I've been dealing with the same issue for a long time, it's not as likely that manipulation is going to be super helpful. Plus, we know that, like we said, those discs are not going to be as, as supple. They're more at risk of being damaged. But we've also developed these long-standing fascial adhesions. So these are the people that the deep tissue work is going to do amazing work for. And as we age, now you've got a 75-year-old with chronic lower back pain, it depends on their muscle tone, right? So if they're fairly big and they've stayed active, good chance they have that Davis law reaction and their tissues thicken and we need to inhibit it. But now say they're, you know, 110 pounds, we have to be really careful there, right? Because they actually might be pathologically um, weak in the core. So if we start loosening up their muscles, instead of making them better, we basically took the shell off that helps hold them together. Now they're gonna be more susceptible to vertebral damage or, you know, injuring themselves further. Not to mention you have to check their medication profile. Like, we had somebody come in yesterday that we, we sent them away because their BP was like over 200 on systolic. But we were looking through the medication profile and she was on 19 different medications. Like polypharmacy to the max. So including in there, we had uh, 600 milligram ibuprofen she was supposed to take twice a day. She was on 81 milligram aspirin. She was also given uh, acetaminophen she was supposed to take twice a day. She had T3 Tylenol, so hydrocodone with acetaminophen in it as well. She also was instructed to take tramadol once a night. Oh my gosh. She was taking all of these medications. So think about the blood thinning effect when we combine aspirin, ibuprofen, and then she was also on levothyroxine, so she was on thyroid medication, um, metformin. Um, it's for uh, diabetes. So, I mean, the, 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 this, this patient is so unpredictable, I, I couldn't possibly in good faith treat this person. Even if their blood pressure was normal, it's so unpredictable what my treatment could do to this person, the risk-benefit ratio isn't acceptable. Predictable than walking up the road. Right, and I don't, I don't know if there's multiple doctors involved or multiple pharmacies involved, but, like, the fact that she has so many different pain medications is, is certainly frightening. Yeah. Um, and as aggressive as our treatment is, like, what are we going to be able to do for, you know, somebody who's 82 that's having back pain that, you know, clearly has problems with coagulation? This is not a patient for us, you know, unfortunately. And I hate to let somebody go in pain, but, you know, the pain versus the possible risk is really not worth it for either one of us from a medical legal perspective and from her healthcare and safety perspective. So like you have to be aware of like what's going on there as well. If somebody's on like high dose hydrocodone, for example, they may not be give you the, the proper feedback to your treatment, right? right. So 
So when you're used to the patient responding with a certain amount of pressure, they may give you abnormal feedback, and that changes the way you're going to treat. You might think you need to push harder, but that is actually not what you need to do because that could actually damage the tissue. So these are other things you have to consider as well. And you have to, so it takes a, a nice a nice amount of treatments under your belt to be able to really know what you're looking at and what you're not looking at. Like your treatment should be fairly predictable. If you have a 45 year old with chronic lower back pain, you should probably know that when you treat them once, they're gonna be a lot better for about four days. It's gonna start creeping back, not as bad as it was. When you do it again, they get a lot better. And we, we fairly know at our office, we're looking at about four visits total, five visits total. If it's not responding that way, one of two things is wrong. Either I'm not treating the right thing or this isn't a patient that's, that's going to appropriate or isn't appropriate for our care. So if it came back the same day, we know that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like it did a little, it did better at the office, but like two hours later it spasmed up again. Mm -hmm. So what is that going to ring off bells in your head? Something else. Something else. Yeah. In my experience, those cases have been people with, with undiagnosed colon cancer or melanoma or METs or things like that. Like you can get the spasm under control, so now we're treating the symptom, right? But we didn't treat the underlying issue because if we did, it would have stayed gone for longer. So that's when we got to get them out of the office and get them imaging. What's meds? Metastatic cancer. Oh, yeah. Also a team that plays in New York. Mm -hmm. So back pain can be complicated. It can also be fairly simplistic. You just have to know what you're looking for. So like if I have pinpoint pain on my PSIS and it kind of radiates away, away from there, what am I thinking? SI joint, SI joint dysfunction. Pretty cut and dry. If it's dull and achy across the lower back, it's stiff when you've been sitting for a long period of time, gets better as you warm up, now what am I thinking? Thoracolumbar fasciitis. Okay. If I, if I have pain that radiates through my butt, wraps around my leg, goes down to my heel, radiculopathy. And it's important to differentiate the type of pain in different areas as well. If the pain is the same the entire way down, like the exact same consistency, burning or whatever else, now I'm thinking radiculopathy. If it's more of like a pain in the leg and then more of a paresthesia below the knee, we might have a nerve entrapment, either sciatic, fibular, or something else near the knee. So you could have tight muscles in the leg like the IT band or the bicep femoris, and that hurts, but then when it gets to the knee, there's actually physical nerve entrapment there. So then we have a paresthesia, a clamp type feeling on the calf and maybe numbness into the lateral two toes. So those descriptions are where you're gonna be able to differentiate between several different things. You also have to differentiate, did something happen? Was there a trauma? Was there an injury? Because the more acute the trauma, the more likely we're looking at a structural lesion. And when I say trauma, like an impact, think about, use, use your logic here, right? Like, so like we had a patient, you know, fibular, head, fibular fracture, right? So think of the mechanism of injury. We had a patient come in, they were kicked in the leg, a um, couple of providers worked on it, didn't, make, didn't get any better, well, we, we understand why. Why could the leg be hurting there? Well, it was an impact to it. So the most likely scenario there is one of either three things, a muscle contusion, a bone bruise, or a fracture. So there's not an impingement. There's not an overuse injury. There's a physical trauma to it that gives us a very direct and linear type of injury. It makes logical sense. There's a progression along the way there. If somebody just starts randomly having tennis elbow and there wasn't a trauma, we can kind of assume that's an overuse injury, correct? Like we were just talking with Jan, her shoulder. So it just started hurting. Her husband was sick. She was spending time in the hospital, laying on her side, sleeping in weird positions. She didn't do anything to hurt it, but her shoulder, which has hurt off and on for a long time, has gotten progressively worse. Now her arm is stuck here. So she's gotten some treatment from the folks here, but it hasn't really gotten any better. So she went and got an MRI, and there's a, there's a tear in the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. But she didn't do anything to tear those muscles. Right? It was there. She didn't do anything to hurt it. She can't remember doing anything. So she didn't, she didn't tear it sleeping, right? We have a chronic injury that maybe, maybe the deltoid has now atrophied and so it can't protect those rotator cuff muscles anymore. Or more likely, she's got a, a humeral impingement. I mean, I just saw it. Like the shoulder's jammed up here. My subacromial space just isn't there. So again, like we talked about the last three semesters, what's our nature of reality? Because if you don't understand philosophy, how could you possibly question the status quo, whether an injury existed before or after we had imaging? And does it make sense? Was there an injury? Was there a trauma? Like, these are the things that make you a great clinician. You have to be able to problem solve these kind of issues. Why? What are the possible reasons? So with, with a kick to the leg, the most likely scenario is there's a trauma, traumatic injury. 
Could there possibly be a nerve entrapment? Yeah, it's possible, but it's really low down on the on the list of things we're looking at. Right, so say fighter punches somebody, here's a crack, there's movement in their hands, they have sharp pain here, it looks physically deformed, what's my most likely? A fracture, a broken bone. Now, if we get an x-ray and it isn't fractured, well now we have something to work with, but my first assumption in this particular case, knowing what I know about traumatic injuries, I'm going to think there's a fracture. Right? And that's the tricky thing that you guys are going to have a hard time with. I think you guys are pretty solid at chronic injuries, but you don't have as much experience with acute injuries. And sometimes you address acute injuries like you would a chronic injury because that's most of what you see. And that's kind of what we're doing in this class is trying to break apart those two things. That way you know when something is or isn't within your scope of practice. Because if I had seen this person with the kick, I would have sent him for an x-ray right away because that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense. That's the only possible thing it could be. Or you could just assume it's a fracture and put him in a boot for four weeks to start with. That fighter will probably want the x-ray to confirm it because they don't want to be in a boot just in case. Because what if it isn't, right? Because that makes a big difference. Because we also have to do what the patient's willing to do. It doesn't matter if we want them to get some imaging if they're not willing to go through with it and, and actually do it, right? Like, what's the point? And if we can't get to the point where they understand the seriousness of it, that's also an issue. So like one of my employees' dads, um, severe upper neck pain, like sharp pain when they move. Uh, we did a lot of muscle work around it, didn't get better. Like, so in his age demographic, he is not a candidate for manipulation. Also, given the symptoms there, we need to clarify that there isn't anything structurally going on there. Maybe a space occupying lesion, really severe arthritis. We don't really know what's going on there. All we know is that our soft tissue work that normally works for this presentation isn't working. So he needs to get an MRI before we continue with care. We've done true treatments, no change. That's enough in my eyes to refer him out. Unless I come up with a radically different approach, which I don't know what else to do at that point because we've tried basically everything. Make sense? If you're doing the same approach, it's not magically going to get better on the fourth or the fifth visit, which is one of the fallacies in chiro, massage, and PT world. They only know how to do one thing, so they're just going to keep doing it. But if it's not working, you have to be able to accept your reality and say, this isn't working for the patient. It's not necessarily my fault, right? But I have to recognize that what I'm doing isn't working, so I either need to change my approach or punt and get that person somewhere else or get them appropriate imaging. You don't just keep going. Because a couple things. One, you, you actually might be making them worse. Two, you're wasting their time and their money. Three, that time and money could be used to pay for something that actually might benefit them. So like we talked about before, it's not just do no harm. It's also do no fiscal harm as well. And that's one thing that gets lost in the system. You know, a lot of, a lot of doctors and hospitals and things like that don't, re, you know, they don't remember that part of it. It's also if you're recommending care that's overly expensive that somebody's either A, not likely to do because of their financial situation, or B, not likely enough to be needed for them, but it might actually put them in a massive hole financially to where now they can't pursue other health care as a result of that. You know, we've run into that with a couple uh, fighters from Scotland and some other places like, they don't have insurance here, so for them to get an MRI, best case scenario, we could maybe get it down to $750, $800 cash. Well, they don't have that right now. But they have health care in Scotland, so they can go back and get an MRI for free. So the flight is cheaper than the image, so, you know, they're going to wait. And then that's what you just have to work with. You can't force them to do it, right? All right, let's start the lecture. <laughs> Certainly. Um, he just, he had a soccer injury. He rolled his ankle in emergency in grade three. Okay. And um, so my grandma, he actually just got surgery a couple days ago. Okay. But it's, it's okay. It's Is he in New Mexico? Yeah. Okay. So maybe we can have him as a model at some point. All right, so lower back pain statistics. So the likelihood of men and women uh, to report low back pain that affects their ability to do work, we see the men have a higher incidence, about 31%, women about 20%. Um, so, so this kind of statistic has a lot of other variables that might be in play, right? So what might those be? Some types of work. Also, right? So yeah, the type of work. So maybe men are doing more construction work. What else? Metal work, since they're doing more metal damage. Maybe even Could be the age. Well, to go to report, actually. Go to report their back pain. Right. I think women are tougher. 
it, it could be the women are tougher, right? Also, what about the, what about cultural norms, right? Like women may not feel as comfortable reporting pain because they're more afraid to lose their jobs potentially. There are there are cultural stereotypes involved in the workplace. There, like it or not, there is a hierarchy. Maybe we've swung back the other direction too far. I mean, I don't really know, but historically, there has been a bias against women in the workplace. So they have been less able to discuss their their physical ailments with their employers because you know. It was the good old boys club. And in, in, in some places, it still is. So that's another potential you know, effect that could be confounding these statistics. So trends in the number of Americans who experience lower back problems in the last three months. Um, as you can see there, the age demographic, so it increases drastically when we get to, or excuse me, over the years. So in 1997, we were looking at about 29% um, in the group 65 years and older. 2013, we're looking at about 33%, 34%. Um, the group 18 years and older, it's gone up a little bit, but not nearly as much as the elderly. So, again, what are some of the reasons this could be? We get, well, we've got a generation, right? So now the baby boomers are now in this age group. There's more of them. So they, th and, and again, this is, this, is, this is truly pseudoscience that we're talking about right now, right? We're making conjectures about things without any truly statistical reason to back them up. And that's what we do in anthropology oftentimes. That's what population studies do. It's a very, very soft science. But we, it has been noted by sociologists, et cetera, that baby boomers have been involved in more risky behaviors, including sporting activities and things like that as well. So that could lead to that increase because now those people are actually in that 65 and older category, right? Um, also, the generation before that, maybe they didn't complain as much. Because we're talking generational here. You go 1997, 65 years before that, this is the World War II generation, the Great Depression generation, the generation that doesn't talk about their feelings, the generation that doesn't want to help, the generation that sucks it up. Right? And these are, of course, stereotypes, but stereotypes that are sort of accepted across the cultural norms and barriers. So we have to, we have to kind of take those things into account as well. It could also be that just people are having more back pain. Maybe they're more obese than they used to be, or maybe whatever, maybe their beds, I mean, I don't know, right? Maybe there's a genetic component to it. Um, more computer work, more, I mean, we, right, we don't really know. We just know that that number exists. Okay, back pain in America, approximately four out of every 10 Americans who seek help for low back pain will go to a chiropractor first. It's actually a surprisingly high number, right? Right, so in the 80s, that became a culturally accepted um, norm. People would go to the chiropractor. So um, as a result of that, the demographics, again, are kind of, there, there's a split that we talk about. Like the older, older generation, they grew up in an area in the Wilkes, um, the Wilkes area, if you guys are familiar with the Wilkes antitrust lawsuit. No? So the, the case first came out in 82. I think it was settled in 88 or 89. But the American Medical Association was found guilty of trying to, to contain and eliminate the profession of chiropractic um, through illegal means. Wow. Do what? Yeah. So they would, they would pass out propaganda to high schools, to um, even middle schools, and, and things like that in the 50s and 60s um, as they were trying to create a monopoly by trying to portray other professions, healthcare professions, as dangerous dogs. The AMA has traditionally done this for a long time. They do it to nurse practitioners, podiatrists, optometrists, nurse, you know, uh, DOs, physical therapists, you know, it's, it's gone on a long time. So there were several organizations that were found guilty, including the American uh, College of Surgeons um, as well for, for, again, putting out propaganda and trying to eliminate a, a potential competitive profession. So that being said, that, that group of people was indoctrinated at an early age in the 50s um, to think that anything that wasn't given by a medical doctor was pseudoscience, was bunk, was, was quackery, was snake oil. So those people are less likely to try anything other than what their doctor says. They're also overly trusting of their doctors as well. And you guys may have noticed this with your grandparents. They don't ask questions. They don't ask if there might be complications between different medications. They don't ask um, what else something could be. They just, the doctor says it, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like 45 and up, I noticed. Yeah. I think there's a split in the, the boomer generation because there's a lot of them, a lot of these professions have actually been boomed, yoga, acupuncture, chiropractic, because of the different thinking in this generation. Remember, this is the, the Timothy Leary generation. This is the LSD, you know, rock and roll generation. So they tend to think outside the box a little bit more. So they're a little bit more likely to, to try other things 
or to question things. And now we're running into a generation of us who question everything and we don't trust anybody because we've been lied to and it's been proven over and over and over again, right? Um, and if, if you have a background in philosophy or whatever else, you understand that any idea stands on, on its own. So you have to look at the fallacies that are involved. Just because a fat person is, is telling you some information about nutrition that maybe even has like a PhD in nutrition, right? It, which is, by the way, just an appeal to authority. That doesn't make the information that he's giving you wrong. Like if you have a personal trainer that's fat, that doesn't mean the exercises he's giving you don't work or the nutrition he uses doesn't work. But our internal bias will say, mm, I don't know about that. So correct information is correct information. It doesn't matter where the source is. It doesn't matter if it's from a, a medical doctor, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a physical therapist. And, and there is nobody with a monopoly on the truth. Because truth is also somewhat subjective because everybody is very different. All of us have different genetic information in our bodies. As we've noticed here in class, all of us respond a little differently to different types of therapies. Some respond well to manipulation. Some don't. Some respond well to really deep tissue work. Some don't. Some respond really well to strength training. Some don't. And this is a pretty homogenous group right here as far as age, as far as activity level. So you can imagine what that would look like in a non-homogenous group of people of different heights and different, you know, different age and different uh, athletic backgrounds and, and things like that. Like, there's very rarely a type of treatment that just goes across the board. So that also speaks to a fallacy found in physical therapy and chiropractic and acupuncture offices as well. Everybody that comes in gets the same treatment? That would be like somebody going to the doctor and every complaint that came in, they would get diabetes medication. It's ludicrous, right? You have to identify the right patient population and then give them the appropriate treatment based on their symptoms, based on their physiology, based on their background and what they've responded well to.